Hello, so I wanted to do a video that was basically an introductory video, sort of from a not physicist, so as a disclaimer, I have no uh, qualifications at all in physics other than what you'd get when you go through the school system, um, towards ionising radiation. So what I want this video to be is hopefully for people who want to find, you know, radiation stuff interesting and get into it, but then see there's like a massive load of basically stuff that, you know, what what's the easy bits to get into first so you can then start, um, you know, picking away at stuff. Because generally the problem you have with ionising radiation topics is you either get articles that are easy to understand but are sort of written for school age children, and sometimes they're not actually truthful, as in they're kind of simplifying and converting the truth of how something works to make it more digestible to a child. The problem is they're learning something wrong in the process, or it's so massively oversimplified it doesn't really apply to real world principles. And then you end up getting these sort of crazy physics, you know, master of physics degree level of word salad where if somebody tries to read into that they're just going to give up. Um, and sadly you'll find a lot of these things, people don't want to, there's not very, there are some very good YouTube channels of ionising radiation, but the point I was going to make out, the problem is there's a lot where, you know, um, especially if you're trying to read stuff where the people who have got sort of all the degrees don't want to make it all that user friendly. You know, and they're saying, well, if you can't understand this, then go away, basically. So what I wanted to do is, through ages and ages of searching where I found stuff where people have simplified it, but not lied about how it works, explain some of the principles. So ionising radiation, we'll start off at the very basics. Ionising radiation is what most people think of when they think of radiation or nuclear radiation. Basically, the harmful kind of thing that gives off energy. Now, again, you have radiation in the sense of lots of other types of energy, but this video is going to be focusing on ionising radiation. This is the word you need to remember, ionising. Um, so, what we're going to start off with is measurements. Because the problem is with ionising radiation, because it's been, obviously, it was discovered in the very late 1800s, what ended up happening was, over time, the definitions have changed in terms of how it's measured. You know, people have come about and they've said, oh, I think this measurement is better than that measurement kind of thing. And the problem is, in all honesty, I don't think any of the measurements are better than each other, but they all have their uses. But the problem is, again, you're running into the problem where somebody's saying, you can't use this measurement because it's outdated, or I prefer this measurement. They're all equally valid, I would say, but you have to kind of get an idea of how they equate to each other. Because the problem is, if you look at historical things where radiation has been measured, often it will be in a measurement called a Röntgen. Um, now, Röntgen is named after Wilhelm Conrad Röntgen. He was, and I'm going to butcher the pronunciation of his name, so I'm not a German. But Röntgen was basically the guy who discovered X-rays, or at least first applied them properly. Um, and then that measurement was named after him in honour. So basically, Röntgen is the guy who kick-started all this radiation stuff, because as far as I'm aware, before Röntgen, nobody knew that there was basically energy you couldn't see in the form of, you know, ionising radiation. And then when he discovered X-rays for messing about with Crookes tubes or cathode tubes, you know, um, this kick-started the whole thing. So the Röntgen unit is named after Röntgen. He didn't say, I want a unit named after me. What's happened with a lot of radiation units is the pioneers of radiation have had units named after them in honour. Um, also, with X-rays, uh, Röntgen wanted them called X-rays. This is a bit of a sidetrack. But um, weirdly, uh, in a few countries, they actually called them Röntgen rays. Um, you know, so the X-ray department in the hospital is called the Röntgen department. Anyway, something quite interesting. So Röntgens were the measure of ionising radiation used by lots and lots of countries until about the 1970s. Now, a Röntgen, the, basically the principle of it is that one Röntgen is one centimetre cubed of air that is ionised. Um, so basically it's quite an easy unit to kind of get your head around. I mean, if the whole idea of ionised air and everything is a bit complicated, then I can't really help you too much with that. But the principle with at least a Röntgen is that one Röntgen equals one cubic centimetre of ionised air, so it's a one that equals a one. Some of the other units are a bit more complicated than that, because some of them are, you know, certain other measurements. So, the measurements that ended up replacing the Röntgen, and this is a good place, I think, in the video, uh, early on in the video to talk about these, is the grey and the sievert. Um, for the most part, there are other radiation measurements as well, but let's let's stick to the main three because a lot of them are derivatives of these three that are just applied slightly differently. So, the grey. Basically, the grey was where a doctor, and I think his name was actually Doctor something grey, I can't remember his first name. Um, so the problem with the Röntgen unit is it's basically applied to one cubic centimetre of air. And that cubic centimetre is basically also air at certain temperatures. 
So what he wanted to do was come up with a radiation measurement thing that took more into account human tissues. Um, because the problem is with humans is that a ronkgen, if you have one ronkgen in the air, it's not going to impact one, you know, or impart one ronkgen's worth of energy to a human, it actually imparts less. Thankfully, we should say, because, you know, I'm sure getting ionised is never a good thing, unless you're having radiotherapy. Um, so, what um, Gray's idea was, was basically, there's a mathematical formula, I can't exact, remember exactly what it is. The point is, Gray's are actually better if you're looking it into human doses, to work out what the damage is coming across as. So basically, the grey unit you see a lot in old Geiger counters or ionisation chambers is the centre grey, CGY. And the reason the centre grey is used is because one centre grey is very close to one ronkgen. However, one centre grey is actually about 1.14 ronkgen. And the reason is, 1.14 ronkgen is about what it takes to actually impact that one you know, that ionisation into a human. So the whole point of the centre grey is that basically one centre grey is the Rontgen, but when it's applied to a man. You also hear, sometimes hear it called the Rontgen, the Rontgen, sorry, equivalent man, the REM. Um, so that's the kind of interesting thing. So the only issue is with centigrades, and this isn't, a, again, some of the problems with radiation stuff, it's not the problem of the people who pioneered this stuff, it's people who kind of came along later. So part of the problem with greys is, of course, and especially the centigrade as a unit, is that lots of nations said, right, we've got to update all our equipment now because it's outdated from using Rontgen measurements to centigrades. But they didn't want to actually do the 1.14 conversion. So the problem is that you end up finding a lot of old military Cold War equipment that's literally Rontgens just with a name changed to centigrade. Um, my favourite example of this is in the set of German decimeter pens I've got, and you think the Germans would be very technical and into this, but there's literally a sticker when you open the um, chest that says 1R equals 1 CGY, as in 1 Rontgen equals 1 centigrade, which is wrong. What was the point of changing it? Because if you have 1 centigrade set as 1 Rontgen, that isn't 1 centigrade. Um, now, I don't mind people if they're trying to just roughly work out numbers saying, you know, 1 centigrade is pretty close to 1 Rontgen, so if they're looking at a value in Rontgen and want to know what it is in greys, you know, doing that. That's not a problem, it's just when, you know, you end up changing your entire unit that your nation is using because you want something that's, you know, more technically accurate to humans, and then you say, well, we can't actually be bothered to do the different bits of maths. So, if I get, if I remember right, one Rontgen is about 0 0.86 centigrades, and one centigrade is about 1.14 Rontgen. So, then and then a unit to complicate things came along called the Sievert a bit later on. Now, Sieverts, this is the one, if you end up buying a modern Geiger counter, you'll probably see the units of Micro Sieverts, Milli Sieverts, Sieverts. Or hopefully you never see Sieverts, because if you're being exposed to a Sievert, you're being exposed to a lot of radiation. So, the idea was with Sieverts, um, Essentially, the Siva, a lot of the Siva, is the greys again. Um, from what I can understand from every time I've checked calibration on the cesium 137 calibrated Geigers, um, that are all in um, Sieverts, they always equal a centigrade in their measurements. Or, you know, they're always equal to a grey. So, one milli grey would be equal to one um, milli Sievert. The thing with milli sieverts is it's basically where there's meant to be a conversion factor done. For example, if you eat something that's an alpha source, which would cause massive damage to you internally, the number of sieverts you've got and it goes up. Basically, sieverts are the ultimate attempt at making until something better comes along. The ultimate attempt of basically harm to humans in the dose form, which is why they're quite popular. Again, I kind of find in some ways they're not as scientific, but sieverts are very good units to work with if you want to just say, how much radiation roughly has somebody been exposed to? Well, if they had an internal dose of something, then it's a higher rating than if it was external dose, basically. So there you go. So, the first long part of this video has covered the three units. You have Rontgens, uh, Greys, and Sieverts. Greys and Sieverts, as I said, are pretty much interchangeable, it would seem, except for Sieverts have a bit more mathematics done to them once you get into the pit, you know, bit of how this works. So what I want to also quickly cover in this video before ending it, because I don't want it to drag on too long, is a Geiger counter versus an ionisation chamber. And I'll show you the units both of these use. This is a Geiger counter tube. Pretty simple. A Geiger counter tube is generally filled with a very non-reactive gas, something such as helium or argon. Um, you have a positive and negative on it, an anode and a cathode, and you have a wire that goes through the middle. The point of these is basically when ionising radiation goes in, it is counted by the Geiger counter tube. There are pros and cons to these, I don't really want to get into that in this video. Here is an ionisation chamber. An ionisation chamber is literally a chamber 
where you've got one side of it is the anode, one side is the cathode, and it measures the volume of air that is being ionised via radiation inside. Ionising radiations, if you want the um, if you want the really quick, simple explanation, ionisation chambers are very, very good if you want to know the energy of the air that is being ionised inside. For the most part. Geiger Muller tubes are very good if you want to just sort of get a quick count of what the radiation levels are like. The bad thing about Geiger Muller tubes, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but you know, the restriction a lot of people don't realise is lots of Geiger counters show you a dose equivalent. The dose equivalent is always calibrated on a source. So the problem is, if you had a Geiger Muller tube and it was exposed to cobalt 60, not cesium 137, it was calibrated on one of those two, your dose equivalent would be wrong. Then Geiger counters are always good that physically show you the count, because when you can see the count, that is the raw unit the Geiger counter is measuring. And that technically isn't wrong for that Geiger counter. However, if it's calibrated on one source and you're using it with another source, the numbers are whack, basically. Now, again, you can still get a good idea, because if it shows you dose equivalent, you can know if you put it on radium, uranium, thorium and all that. Um, you know, you know it's not going to be the right measurement, but you can still see trends, so you can still see how much the counts are correlating to everything else. The beautiful thing of ionisation chambers, despite how simple they are, is because the air physically is ionising in the chamber and being measured, what that means is if you have an open air ionisation chamber, for example, and you put an alpha source in there, you can see the needle move a hell of a lot more um, than if it was basically a gamma source of a similar strength. So again, this is coming back into the sievert thing. You can almost do some experiments yourself with sieverts and things, saying, I've got an ionisation chamber, you know, how much is the needle going to move with a piece of americinium compared to a piece of radium compared, compared to a piece of uranium, something like that. Right, what I want to cover quickly in this video is common sources of radiation and also cover laws regarding radiation for, you know, people like you and me. So, types of radiation. The most common types of radiation most people know of is uranium and thorium, because they are naturally occurring metals on the Earth, and this isn't going to be a total list of everything that gives off radiation in this video. So, ionising radiation, um, uranium and thorium, they're the two most common on Earth. The much rarer one that turns up on Earth and is much, much stronger is called radium. Now, radium you might know about because there was a period at one point in history where, thankfully not this watch, um, watches and dials and all sorts of things were painted with them. I love collecting these and antiques and measuring just how deadly they were in a sense, but at one point, because radium was so radioactive it would make the air around it glow, people thought, this is great, right, to put on watches and things you want to see in the dark. The issue is, radium gives off a lot of energy if you're not storing it properly. Um, and having it on your wrist 24-7 is not a good thing to do, because of the gamma rays will constantly be shooting into you, and if you're doing that and looking at it, you're probably getting beta rays right into your face as well. So, that, that isn't great. Um, then, of course, you get radionuclides later on, so what you end up getting is things like, you know, maiden reactors through neutrons hitting them. You get things like cobalt-60, cesium-137, strontium-90. There's quite a few that you get, americinium-241. But the point is that, you know, there's lots and lots of things. So you might be surprised to know you've probably got a few radioactive things in your house, whether it be in your smoke alarm, in an old radium watch, some old dinnerware where people thought it was a good idea to paint them with uranium paint. You'd be surprised at how many random items give off ionising radiation. Um, and that's completely even ignoring, you know, if you go to the hospital and get an x-ray. You're basically being blasted with gamma rays, and that's what x-rays are. So, that's all that. So what I want to finish off with for the people interested in radioactive items is what are the laws surrounding them? Now, please, please, please look up the laws in your country properly before going any further. Because, weirdly, the laws in every country can vary massively. So, for example, in the United States, you're not allowed to take a americinium out of smoke alarms, but in the UK you can, even though more, normally the UK is more restrictive than the States. Um, now, basically, how this all works is, in most countries, well, again, not always the most results, I'll say what the case is in the UK, because I've read into this to make sure I was following the law. If you want to collect radioactive check sources, Firstly, you're going to have to find a list if there's any banned sources or you're limited to a certain amount of them. Sometimes these aren't the easiest, you know, charts to understand. And sometimes the person writing them also didn't really understand much about ionising radiation, but they were the government minister who was put in charge of, you know, writing up this list. So basically, first check that there's nothing on the list you're not allowed to own full stop. And then, you know, you'd hope that you couldn't easily buy this stuff. Um, if it's illegal in your country, but the problem is, you know, we all know how shit like that works. 
in reality. So first look up the list. If there's anything you're definitely not allowed, don't buy it. That's the easy thing. If there's anything you're allowed but in certain quantities, always err on the side of caution. So say I'm going to buy a lot less than I should be allowed in total, not, you know, not really push it to the limit. Then um, what you need to do once you've got this stuff is store it safely. Please, please, please store it safely. So what I find is really useful for storing radioactive check sources is metal ammo cans, you know, like 30 cal, 50 cal, grenade ammo cans, the ones with the really good watertight sealing lids. So you put them in, you seal the lid down, and then you can either around the outside of it or the inside of it, wrap lead sheeting around, as in the thin lead sheeting you can buy in bulk pretty cheaply because it's like lead scrap. Use that and that will uh, dumb down some of the gamma rays coming out. So. The main thing then is store it where children aren't going to get access to it, pets aren't going to get access to it, and most importantly, it's not in a position in your house where it's blasting your family full of gamma rays. So the idea is that basically, you find the most remote part of your house nobody sleeps in, you know, a lot of people say the garage, the garage, you know, maybe the attic is good for this, but depend of course it depends where they are positioned in the grand scheme of your house. Put it on the further side where it's not near you, not near your neighbours, you know, all that sort of stuff. And then, basically, um, store it there. So when you want to get it out and do some tests or experiments with it, you've got it, but for the most part, you're not being exposed to more than background doses. And another thing I'll quickly add on is with gamma energy, there's a thing called the inverse square law. Basically, the closer you are to it, the stronger it is. The further you are away from it, the weaker it is. So basically, the simple logic is, the further you store it away from yourself and other people, the less you're ever going to be exposed to. People are always exposed to background radiation anyway. So you're never going to have a Geiger counter or something, turn it on and say, oh, it's zero. Unless you're being exposed to horrific amounts of radiation, which is tripping the Geiger. But that's a whole subject for another video. All the Geiger isn't working. Um, but assuming you've got a working Geiger, in most places there is always background radiation. You're never going to find a place where there isn't background radiation. So the point is what you want to do with all your samples is make sure they're stored somewhere so when you're in a living area of your house, you know, there is no extra thing. And that's the nice thing at least with a Geiger counter or some of these measurement devices. If you've got one, you can turn it on, go around your house and check, you know, everywhere is safe for background radiation. Right, that's been a long um, video, hasn't it? I hope you found this interesting to people into radiation because it's been a bit of a waffle. Hopefully it's explained to you some of the very basics. Um, it's a fascinating rabbit hole to get into, ionising radiation. The more and more you get into it, the more and more you go. I keep wanting to buy vintage Geiger counters, all these old weird check sources. Um, but the point is, it's a fascinating subject. I think it's one that's really interesting for lots of people to get into and expand their knowledge. The problem is that often, as I said at the beginning of the video, it's not made that accessible by a lot of people, unfortunately. But hopefully you've found it interesting and learned something.